Thank you for watching this sermon from Kings Park International Church. Be sure to check out the other sermons in this series as well. God became a man. God became man in Jesus Christ. He ascended to heaven to reign over all. He offers forgiveness of sin. He offers forgiveness of sin and the gift of salvation. Forgiveness of sins and the gift of salvation. And the gift of salvation to all those who repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. So glad y'all have joined us today from your homes or apartments, in your bedroom, your dining room, or your living room couch. Whether you just woke up and you're still in your PJs with a coffee mug in your hand, or you are all dressed up as if you were physically here in this church building. As my roommate can attest, I certainly have done both these past few Sundays. Now, th this last month has been really interesting, to say the least. This pandemic has impacted my personal life, along with many of ours, in more ways than I initially expected. Beyond just the mere inconveniences of not being able to get a haircut or go to a restaurant. For, for example, a couple weeks ago, I find myself being hyper alert to anything that felt slightly off with my body. Thinking that even the slightest thing might be a sign that I have the coronavirus, a heart attack, or, or something deadly. Now, now, these waves of thoughts, combined with being surrounded or really surrounding myself with continual news of the pandemic, often led to passing but real intense experiences of panic and worry. And furthermore, like many of us, there are many people we know who in the past few weeks have had relatives who passed away, often suddenly because of coronavirus. And this pandemic has impacted some of you in even more ways. So what are we to make of all of this? Now more than ever, we need good news. So how is the gospel good news for us today in this crazy time? Where is Jesus? And what is he doing in the midst of all of this? Well, we've been in a series this Easter season called The Good News, where we have been studying the key elements of the gospel centered on the person of Jesus. We've looked at the life death and resurrection of Jesus. And today we're gonna to look at the final component, one of the most overlooked components of the gospel. It's the ascension of Christ. Now this is the part in our gospel statement that says he, Jesus, ascended to heaven to reign over all. Now some of y'all might be wondering, David, David, what does that exactly mean that he ascended to heaven? Well, we're going to spend the first part of our time today looking at what is the ascension of Christ, and then we're going to look at what does it mean for us. Now, if you have any questions throughout this message, please post it on the chat section on our YouTube or Facebook, and after the message, we're going to have what we call our five more minutes live Q&A, where I'll be able to answer some of those questions. Now, this is our main idea for today. The ascension of Christ means... Jesus rules over all and is powerfully bringing about our good. Now, let me give you some context for today's passage in Acts 2. About 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, Peter, one of his closest followers, preaches his most famous sermon in the entire Bible. And in it, Peter explains what the ascension of Christ means and how, arguing that actually it is the fulfillment of promises God had made about a thousand years before. Now, Peter's sermon is a bit lengthy, so we're only going to read and focus on the climax of his message in Acts 2, verse 29 to 36. And it says this, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. 
For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to realize that the ascension of Christ is really good news for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. The ascension of Christ means Jesus rules over all and is powerfully bringing about our good. So let's first look at what is the ascension of Christ. Now, verse 33 to 35, Peter compares and contrasts Jesus with King David, who is the greatest king in Israel's history, lived about a thousand years before Peter's time. And in it, Peter shows that Jesus has done something that King David didn't. We see in our passage that Jesus was exalted at the right hand of God, whereas David did not ascend into the heavens. David was buried and his tomb is still around to this day. See, being exalted at the right hand of God and ascending to the heavens refers to the same thing. It refers to the ascension of Christ. Now, this is the event that happened in the chapter right before, where 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead, he's giving his last instructions to his followers. And we see in Acts 1-9 that as they, the disciples, were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. That is the ascension of Christ. That Jesus, who is simultaneously fully God and fully man, rose from the dead and did not die again. Instead, he and his resurrected body ascended into heaven. He physically left earth and went to heaven. And in heaven, he is there to this day, present, fully alive as a human with a human body. Now, what does all of that mean for us? Why is it good news that Jesus ascended into heaven rather than staying on earth? Why, why should we celebrate that Jesus left earth 2,000 years ago? Because it, it, it kind of feels like he conveniently left us here. I mean, I mean, imagine if this, your favorite college basketball team, let's say UNC or Duke, they just won the semifinals, and they're going to the national championship, and then all of a sudden the head coach, so Coach K or Roy Williams says, I'm going home, and then they fly back to Durham Chapel Hill. Or, or if your young company is really beginning to build momentum under the leadership and vision of your founder, CEO, and right before entering to some crucial meetings with some potential key investors, your CEO says, I- I'm going to Hawaii, and then leaves. The ascension can sometimes feel like that, as if Jesus just peaced out, left earth, went to heaven, and abandoned us here on this mess of earth that is dealing with all sorts of issues, including this pandemic. However, as we dive deeper into the Bible, we're going to see that the ascension of Christ actually means the exact opposite. We see the ultimate meaning of the ascension in verse 36. Peter says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. See, that is the meaning of the ascension. That God the Father has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. Now let's break those two things down separately. Let's first look at Lord. The ascension of Christ means Jesus rules over all. Now we see this first in the fact that Jesus ascended to heaven. Now we often have this wrong idea about heaven. That's this place miles high up in space beyond the stars and the Milky Way. So Jesus ascending to heaven means he's now really far away from us. However, in the Bible, heaven and earth are not two different spatial locations. They're actually two different but overlapping dimensions or spheres of God's creation. Heaven is as close to us as our breath itself, as real as our three-dimensional world of the earth. Heaven is the place where God the Father dwells. It is God's dimension, which intersects with our dimension, but transcends it. And because of that, heaven and earth interact with each other in a way where God, who is in heaven, can simultaneously be anywhere and everywhere on earth. Now, Now, this is why it's so important to have a right view of heaven. Because the ascension of Christ means that Jesus goes not way beyond the stars far away from us, but into this 
dimension. It means that Jesus hasn't abandoned us. He's not far away from us. And in fact, he's more powerfully present with us now than he was 2,000 years ago when he was on the earth. Because in heaven, he's available and accessible. He's present with his people everywhere without people having to travel to a specific spot on the earth to find him. This is good news. This means that we can have access to Jesus at all times. That he is right now with you, right where you are. Whether you are in your dining room or your bedroom or your living room, wherever you are watching this, you do not have to physically come to this physical church building in order to find Jesus. Furthermore, heaven is the control room for earth. It's basically where earth is run from. Basically, Jesus ascending to heaven means he's now in full charge of the earth. That, that's why the ascension of Christ is sometimes described as Jesus being exalted at the right hand of God. We see in verse 33. Now, it's not that God the Father literally has a right hand. In the Old Testament context, to sit at the right hand of a monarch was to occupy the position of executive rulership on the monarch's behalf. So Jesus sitting on the throne at the right hand of God the Father means Jesus currently occupies the position of executive rulership on God the Father's behalf. This means that the ascension is that Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and on earth and currently reigns as Lord over the earth. Now back to our passage, it provides another proof that Jesus rules over all by connecting the ascension of Christ with the fulfillment of promises God has made. We see in verse 29 to 30 that Peter refers to an unbreakable promise that God made about a thousand years before Peter's time. God made it to King David that one of David's descendants would have a never-ending throne and rule the kingdom of God. And then Peter refers to a prophecy that King David said that God would say to his descendant, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Peter is arguing that the ascension is the fulfillment of those promises and therefore the inauguration of a new age under King Jesus. That the ascension is the confirmation that Jesus, who is one of the descendants of King David, is the promised eternal king who rules over all. Now that is really good news for us even right now because that means that Jesus is very much fully powerfully present with us and in full control. It means that even when things don't look like it, Jesus is still Lord, not COVID-19, not the stock market, not, not your bank account. And because of that, because Jesus is Lord, this means that our ultimate hope does not lie in the influence or earthly power of any political entity. See, often when we forget about the ascension, or when we ignore the ascension, we are tempted to view a nation, a government system, a political party, a political figure as the hope of the world. And then we get disillusioned when they fail us. However, you see, the ascension of Christ confronts us, whether we are conservatives or liberals, leaning politically left or right, it reminds us that America is not the hope of the world, nor is democracy, nor is more government spending and programs to try to create less economic inequality, nor is less government intervention and regulation to try to create more individual freedom, nor is socialism nor is capitalism. Jesus is the hope of the world. See, currently COVID-19 has shown us this, that arguably the most powerful nation in the world with the largest economy has been brought to its knees. But not just our nation. Every nation around the world has been impacted in one way or another, no matter their political philosophy, government structure, healthcare system, economic development, See, King's part, our ultimate hope is not in the White House or the results of November 3rd. It's not in Congress or our governor or the CDC. Our ultimate hope is not in a larger stimulus packet or a healthier stock market or more accessible coronavirus tests or a vaccine or a face mask or hand sanitizers. Those things may be helpful, but that is not where our ultimate hope lies. 
our ultimate hope lies in the fact that Jesus is currently ruling over all. Now, one of the ways by which Jesus expresses his ruling and reigning over all is through his church. That's why it's now more than ever so important that those of us who follow Jesus, we are to, as a church, reflect the selfless love of Christ and rest in the peace of God during these crazy times. So what have we seen? That the ascension of Christ means Jesus rules over all. Now, some of y'all might be wondering, so how is that good news? Well, the ascension of Christ doesn't just mean that. Because back in verse 36, Peter says, God has made him both Lord and Christ. The ascension of Christ means Jesus rules over all and is powerfully bringing about our good. See, Jesus isn't just in a position of power and authority. He's using that power in his role as the Christ. Now, we need to understand the meaning of the word Christ. Christ isn't Jesus' last name. It literally means anointed one or one appointed by God to a particular role or office. Now, in the Old Testament, there are three groups of officials who are considered as anointed ones. They were prophets, kings, and priests. And because Jesus is the Christ, he is the ultimate anointed one, fulfilling all three roles. As the Christ, he is the ultimate prophet, not only speaking the word of God, which is what prophets did, but he himself is called the word of God because everything Jesus says, God says, because Jesus is fully God. As the Christ, Jesus is also the ultimate king. He's the king of the eternal kingdom of God. And as the Christ, Jesus is the ultimate priest. Now, in the Old Testament, the role of the priest was to represent the people before God and to intercede or mediate between God and the people. So they would go into the temple, which is where the presence of God dwelled at that time, and they would offer up animal sacrifices. Now, because of the ascension, when Peter uses the word Christ, it is this particular role as priest in addition to the role as king that Peter is highlighting. See, Jesus is our ultimate mediator who's already offered up the ultimate sacrifice. We see in verse 36 that Jesus was crucified. And that Jesus, sacrifice of his own life on the cross, paid for our sins once and for all. See, on the cross, Jesus demonstrated that he is for our good. But being willing to pay the ultimate price to bring about our ultimate good, which is our salvation from sin and hell, eternal damnation, and being brought into a loving relationship with God. But Jesus doesn't just stop there. He doesn't stop at just the cross and the resurrection. In heaven right now, the ascended Jesus is powerfully bringing about our good. Because Jesus ascended, remaining fully God and fully man, Jesus continues his role as a mediator or bridge between God and humanity. He's representing humanity in heaven. See, because Jesus is fully human, this means that he truly knows you. He understands you. He gets you. Even when no one else does. Even when you're always being misunderstood by everyone else. He knows exactly what you are feeling. He knows exactly what you were going through. And this same Jesus is interceding on your behalf. Jesus is advocating for us. And he's intervening in our interests from his throne. Jesus, as Lord over all, is powerfully bringing about our good. Now, one of the primary evidences that he's actually doing this is in the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. You see, the, the night before Jesus was crucified, he told his disciples that he was about to go away. And this is what he told them in John chapter 16. It is to your advantage or for your good that I go away. For I, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes... He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, and he will guide you into all the truth. And then in Acts 1, 1 to 8, Jesus, before his ascension, tells his disciples to wait 
until they receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And then we get to our passage in Acts 2.33, where we see that because of the ascension, Jesus receives the promise of the Holy Spirit in a unique way where he now has the authority to pour out the Holy Spirit fully. And then he actually uses that authority by pouring out the Holy Spirit earlier in this chapter at Pentecost, which is when the Holy Spirit empowered the disciples to be more effective witnesses for the gospel by by filling them with boldness and enabling them to do supernatural things, such as miraculously speaking in other languages or healing the sick or prophesying. Now, Jesus doing all of that after his ascension is proof that he isn't just twiddling his thumbs in heaven. He is intervening on our behalf, actively bringing about our good, providing what or rather who we need the most, which is the Holy Spirit. In heaven right now, Jesus is through the Holy Spirit leading, guiding us, healing us, empowering us, releasing his gifts to us. Now, if you want to know more about this topic, or you want to experience the power of the Holy Spirit in this way, I would highly recommend for you to attend our Biblical Foundations Life Group, which covers this as one of their topics. You can find more information on our group's page on our website. Now, so, so what have we seen? That Jesus ascended to heaven so he would be in a position to rule over all and powerfully bring about our good. And because of all this, we can have great comfort and hope. We can have a great comfort because we have a mediator who's not only for our good, but he's also in a position of power to bring about our good. Nothing can prevent him from fulfilling his purposes for us. He will bring about our good, period. Why? Because Jesus rules over all. And that should bring great joy to us. See, in this chaotic world, we often so easily freak out because we feel as if the world has taken our lives so out of our control. And we feel that we need to be in control in order to bring about our good. But the ascension of Christ says this, that we have a mediator who is more committed to bringing about our good than we ever can be because he's the Christ. And he's in a better position of power to bring about our good, then we can never be. He is the Lord. Furthermore, we can have a hope because we have a promised future. Right now in heaven, Jesus is preparing our future, working out all things. Yes, that does include coronavirus and death and unemployment. All things. He's working out all things towards a certain inevitable end which is the culmination of the glory of God, our ultimate good and our deepest joy, which is when Jesus returns and we get to live in the new heavens and the new earth where there will be no more pain, sin, death, and pandemic. And we get to purely worship and glorify God. And we get to perfectly delight and be satisfied in him. That is the hope, the comfort, and the joy that the ascension of Christ gives us. So in summary, the ascension of Christ means Jesus rules over all and is powerfully bringing about our good. This is really good news for us. We need to continually be reminded that no matter how bad things get, Jesus is still fully in control and he's bringing about our good. Now, as we have come to the end of our series, what should we take away from all of this? Is that the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ, change was the turning point in human history. That what God did in Christ 2,000 years ago can change your life even right now in 2020. See, whether you are exploring Christianity and want to know your next steps, or you have been following Jesus for a really long time, we are all called by God to go deeper into the gospel understanding the gospel more clearly, believing in the gospel more deeply, and applying the gospel more fully. This gospel should be our primary worldview, the lens by which we view everything else, the rest of this world, including this pandemic. The gospel provides an unwavering hope 
to a broken and hurting world. Real life change to those stuck in sin. The true joy of the Holy Spirit to those who despair. Clarity in the midst of this confusing world. Everlasting stability in all this chaos. Complete forgiveness. No matter our sinful past. And the eternal love of Christ to our love-starved hearts. That is really good news. And we ought to tell this to others. Now, as we end our series, let us, as a church, recite the gospel statement together. In fact, please read out loud with me wherever you are viewing this. In fact, right now, stand up. Yes, yeah, yeah, stand up right now. Get that blood flowing through your legs. If you have kids, get them involved. This is the time for everyone to participate. Now, stand up. Yes, yeah, stand up. Now, I, I would highly encourage you in the middle of this week to find another time to recite the gospel statement, especially before you watch the news. Why? Because now more than ever, we need to continually remind ourselves of the gospel. You can find the full gospel statement on our good news card, rather on our sermon page or on our social media. So everyone standing up to repeat or recite this gospel statement with me. The gospel is the good news that God became a man in Jesus Christ. He lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died in our place. After three days, he rose from the dead, proving that he is the son of God. He ascended to heaven to reign over all. He offers forgiveness of sins and the gift of salvation to all those who repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let's pray this time. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that the ascension of Christ is really good news. So God, help us to apply that to our lives. Now, there, there's some of you right now watching this. You are a follower of Jesus. And, and this past month has been really challenging. And you really need some comfort and hope right now. Maybe so there's some of you who are college students who you're, the rest, the end of your, the second half of your spring semester just was abruptly ended and you've had to go back home, which isn't the most peaceful and positive experience and environment. And furthermore, you're struggling with trying to learn classes online. Or maybe some of you are also young parents and you are really exhausted right now, a bit overwhelmed because you're trying to take care of your kids and homeschool for the first time because you can't send them to school. And in the meantime, you're also trying to do work from home and you really need some strength. And there are others of you, you, you've been laid off because of this pandemic, and you don't know when you're going to see your next paycheck. And that $1,200 stimulus isn't going to last for long. There are others of you who you, you live by yourself. And this pandemic, these stay-at-homes, has only exacerbated your loneliness, and maybe even depression. And others of you, you're struggling with grief right now because you've had loved ones who've passed away because of this pandemic. I want to pray for you right now, that you experience the comfort, the hope that can only be found in the gospel. Father, I pray right now that would these individuals be reminded afresh that Jesus, because you lived a perfect human life, you know exactly what it's like to experience grief and loss, that you are present with them right now and you understand them, but that also you rose from the dead and because of your resurrection power, you can give grace and strength to those who are struggling and exhausted and tired right now. And that because you rose from the dead and you ascended to heaven, you are ruling and reigning and you are in control, bringing about their good. Now, there's another group of you who are even more directly impacted by COVID-19. First, for example, there are some of you who are medical professionals and you are right now in the forefront fighting COVID-19. I want to say first, thank you. Thank you for risking your life to help others. And maybe right now, as you're interacting with patients who have COVID-19, you're experiencing real anxiety for fear that you might also yourself contract that pandemic, that virus. Or there are others of you who are sick right now with the coronavirus, and you're not sure maybe if you'll make it, or you're, you're worried that you may have unintentionally passed this to a loved one. 
I want to pray for you. Father, I ask, will you strengthen them right now? Thank you, Jesus, that on the cross you died for our sins, but you also purchased our healing. So, Father, I pray for anyone who's sick with this virus right now. Would you heal them in Jesus' name? Would you kill the virus in their body right now? And, Jesus, I thank you because you rose from the dead. Your resurrection power and you ascended into heaven. You are ruling over all. And you are protecting our medical professionals that they will not get the virus. But instead, as they serve and help others, they will be able to be instruments by which you bring healing to others in Jesus' name. And one last group, as you've been listening to this message, you realize you are not a follower of Jesus. And your next steps are the next steps that Peter mentions in verse 36, that you are to know for certain that God has made Jesus, both the Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. God has made him Lord. That means he's Lord over all. He's the boss, the king of the universe. That means you ought to submit under his rulership. And he's the Christ. He's done everything needed to save you from your sins and bring you into a loving relationship with God. This Jesus whom you crucified, that even though you may not have physically crucified Jesus, like the audience of Peter, because of your sins, your sins put Jesus on the cross. Your next step is to repent, which is a fancy term of just saying, turning away from your sins, turning away from trying to be the boss of your own life and submitting under the lordship, the rulership of Jesus and trusting in Jesus to be your mediator, to be the Christ. And if that is you, I'd ask for you to pray this prayer with me where you want to follow Jesus. You can repeat after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for creating me and loving me. I confess I am a sinner and I ask you to forgive me. Jesus, I believe that you lived the perfect life that you died the death that we deserved on the cross. And you rose from the dead. And you ascended into heaven to reign over all. I submit to you and trust in you as my Lord and Savior. And I ask you, thank you for making me a new person. Holy Spirit, Take my life and help me to follow you and do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you have questions or prayer requests, please email us at info at kingspark.org or message us on one of our social media channels. If you would like to give, you can do so by visiting kingspark.org giving or by downloading the Kings Park app.